<laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am going to be doing a talk. As Marie mentioned, I've been trying to come to Kick to do a talk for a couple of years, and the subject matter, which I'm going to talk about, has changed dramatically. I am an artist based in London who's interested in systems of knowledge and how knowledge is formed and kept, and I work primarily, or a, a lot of my work is made using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in the past two years, there has been a dramatic change in the landscape and what's possible and what's feasible. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how that evolution has happened within my own creative practice and some of the things that I find are interesting or exciting and worrying in this space at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I work heavily with technology with, as part of my creative practice, and there's extremely strong relationship between data and information and the eventual um, input, the input and the eventual output, the visual output that comes out. And for the past eight or so years, I've been working with uh, machine learning, where the idea of a data set, the information that you give to the algorithm um, from which it learns, is fundamental. And, but at the same time, the idea of what is a data set can be a bit contentious from the content of kind of what goes into it to the categories that that information is organized in to its very definition. Uh, a data set is defined, if you take a dictionary definition, as a collection of separate sets of information that is treated by a single unit by a computer, which can mean that all data, um, information that can be read, manipulated, and programmatically transformed by a computer can become a data set. But a data set kind of can stop being seen as such as it becomes taken out of the context of the algorith algorithmic, but, which is all getting very academic. But basically, the idea of a data set is becoming more and more inseparable from machine learning and artificial intelligence for its crucial role and its function functionality. What is contained in the data set becomes the knowledge that the algorithm has in order to create wo its world. If a data set only contains cats, whatever is, whatever is trained on it will only be able to understand cats. It sees or creates everything as a cat. Data sets need to be extremely large in order for algorithms to have enough information to make inferences. They also need to be cleaned and standardized in order for them to be usable. And for me, there is this strong parallel between um, with encyclopedias that starts to emerge. Encyclopedias are a prime example of how various objects are classified. They illustrate the search for a universal system to describe the world. And data sets can then be seen, at, seen as a kind of contemporary encyclopedia. Both data sets and encyclopedias are trying to record everything in the world and make decisions about what is important enough to be recorded. And significantly, both are systems of organizing knowledge, which may or may not have um, immediate author attributions um, following each entry. What's playing at the moment is uh, a part of a piece that I made um, in 2020 called Laws of Order's Form, which is an ongoing project that explores this and how historic taxonomies and beliefs can still be heard in modern implementations of machine learning. Um, I created this video work of documenting the process of going through hundreds of Victorian and Edwardian encyclopedias to take out the images and um, different kind of entries to create my own data set. And by collapsing this kind of, this moment of history with the today's current concerns around data set bias, the project attempted to kind of think through some of the problems with classification without thought and how these histories of how these things work remain in our present even within these latest technologies. When the kind of decisions are made as to what is included or excluded, um, it can lead to idiosyncratic and absurd choices. Um, and this is something that I found really interesting and I attempted to do with my own piece. So after I kind of created these, um, this data set, I then chose to recontextualize the images with new categories that I'd created. 
and the specifics of the encyclopedia entries were changed to new and abstracted terms. Part of the data set that I made is available to download from in a zip folder, allowing people to explore and reclassify the images, taking them off the fixed page and allowing the definitions to become more fluid and changing. And this kind of connection between data sets and encyclopedias is one that I, I really enjoyed making. Um, the, there are these, as I mentioned before, the labor that goes into it is it's very similar. It's anonymous, hidden, it becomes um, almost invisible. But there is a key difference. People doing the work of labeling or finding the imagery for data sets tend not to be expert in the fields. It's done for the most part by mechanical turkers who are paid very small amounts of money per, per task and who want the work to be done as quickly as possible. Imagery tends to come to the from the internet, which is one layer of standardization, and then it's kind of decided um, by these individuals for it to kind of fit a certain term. But there is a kind of human in the loop, even in this system, someone who's taking this information and then kind of deciding whether it fits um, something or not, which is, I think, interesting and important when you kind of start to think about how these data sets are being constructed uh, now. But these kind of more traditional way of making data sets, things like ImageNet, um, Faces in the Wild, they're kind of fixed and frozen in a certain amount of time. People assume that with technology, it's easier to have a more inclusive database with a more nuanced approach to representation, but all the choices that occur when constructing a data, uh, when constructing an encyclopedia or a data set are still there. Data can still be warped, manipulated, ignored or lost, whether it was kind of put into these systems five, 15 or 500 years ago. And this manual construction of data sets, so kind of taking an image and making a label myself and constructing it, taking it, doing this multiple times, again and again and again, is something that I have worked extensively with. I do a lot of my work with GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which I started working with 2016, 2017. Um, carefully constructing an, my own system, which I could then um, map kind of my ideas on when I was making work. One of the projects that I'm most well known for um, is a uh, work that I've done with Tulips, um, a part of which was shown at Kick Festival uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I made a data set for it um, in 2018, back at the time when this was just something that people were starting to kind of think, think through the critical and conceptual um, problems with. I took 10,000 photographs of tulips. Um, I was on residency in the Netherlands, so it was uh, lucky because tulips were quite cheap which forced me to examine each image and inverts the usual process for creating this type of data set. There's a huge difference from pulling 20,000 images from Google um, and taking 20,000 photographs yourself. When you do the latter, you notice, and I think this is like a key thing that I find interesting about working with data in the context of machine learning, this idea of attention and attention and giving attention to an object and really understanding it through this kind of work and labor of kind of repeating the, repeatedly photographing it or looking at it and understanding it. Um, you understand that there's no ideal type of flower, there's no perfect one. The differences are noticed, noticed and the process becomes almost like craft, repetitive, time consuming, but necessary in order to produce something beautiful. And there is a real skill to it, I feel, about how you construct um, a database. And up until fairly recently, databases were included um, in the UK under um, a kind of literary works and copyright law because there was an acknowledgement of the labor and time that kind of went into it. And this particular data set, this tulip data set, became an artwork in and of itself. Um, it's a functional thing. It, it, you know, it works and kind of um, as a as a kind of scientific piece of um, a scientific object. But it's also an artwork, and I chose to really emphasize this um, by presenting it as such. It's easy to forget in a digital age um, that information is physical and that everything that you see on a screen eventually started out in the real world. 
And by placing things back into the real world, people can comprehend perhaps more about data and the amount of time and effort and um, money that it kind of actually um, takes to kind of create these things. So the installation, when it's shown is in its entirety, is around 50 square meters um, of these photographs of tulips, each of which have a ha uh, the handwritten label, again, emphasizing the kind of the, the, the humanness that actually is, again, behind a lot of these algorithmic processes, um, divided into different color panels. And you can start to have discussions about the fact that there is always this human decision-making um, along the chain of AI, and it's not this absolute correct thing. Even as something as simple as a tulip is difficult to put into discrete categories. Is it white or pale pink? Is it orange or is it yellow? And you can start to kind of grasp this idea around the difficulty of actually um, using language or using these categories to define something as simple as a flower, you really start to understand how difficult it will be to describe something more nebulous or complex, such as gender or identity. Um, and so this is kind of like how I've been working for the past couple of years, uh, for the part from kind of 2017, 2018, 2019, even to the start of 2020. But the latest developments in this space has meant that the way that the models are trained and produced imagery has changed dramatically. Showing on screen right now is a small snippet of an image um, that I've made in collaboration with Sophia Crespo using a variety of different um, text-to-image models, so things like DALI and Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. The way that these models work um, is not, isn't like a GAN, where you've kind of got two networks that are trained on what you now kind of would consider to be a relatively small amount of data, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 images. Um, these are made uh, using kind of um, a two-part model, a prior and decoder, which kind of uses the input of a sentence um, to create this very well-defined output. And these models are relatively new in the kind of scheme of things. Uh, DALI, the, the transform, is, which is a transformer system, was announced in January 2021. DALI-2 was April 2022, and Stable Diffusion was publicly released in August of 2022. So these systems are really only a year, a year and a half, two years old. But the way that they've shaped both the kind of conversation around AI and how people are using them creatively is immense. And one of the things that I find both interesting and worrisome is the huge amount of information that is needed to create them. So unlike kind of the models that I was making where I was taking every single picture, and unlike even the kind of data sets that were kind of used before for kind of um, computer vision things, um, where like ImageNet, where you, you know, there were several million images, but they were downloadable and you could look at them. Um, the kind of information and the data that is being used to train these new systems is, is immense. Um, and it's hugely reliant on what is the, on the internet and how that has been labeled. Um, as I mentioned, so OpenAI and Midjourney are closed systems, they're not open sourced. So the data that these, um, that these models have been trained on isn't available. Um, OpenAI have said that it's trained DALI 2 on hundreds of millions of captioned image images, but it hasn't released what those images are. Stable Diffusion has used this um, database called Lion, but this is impossible for most people to download and search because it contains metadata for millions and, bil and actually billions of images that are stored in obscure file formats in large multi-part multi archives. Lion's image databases are built off the Common Crawl, which is this nonprofit that scrapes um, billions of web pages monthly and then releases them as massive data sets. It's collected all HTML image tags um, 
that have all these alt text attributes and classified the resulting five billion image pairs based on their language, which is just immense. Five billion images is sucked up the entire internet. And there's, it's just so much data, so much information that it's actually really hard to understand what's in it. Some people um, have done some analysis where they've taken a subset and analyzed, um, I think it was something like uh, around 20 million of these images. And of those that they analyzed, just taking a, a representative kind of sample, around 47% are sourced from only 100 domains. So even though you're just taking the whole internet, it's being really overrepresented by certain, um, certain domains. With the largest number of images coming from Pinterest, which is, was about 8.5% uh, of the total that they analyzed, which is where you can see there's kind of like a certain aesthetic that comes out in some of these models. Um, if you've played around with Dali or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, some of them give kind of like um, very kind of like different, uh, very certain aesthetics. And that can, that's been attributed in part to them um, using large amounts of these kind of, um, of these of, of images from these certain websites. And the other thing that, that was found through doing this analysis on, the, on this, um, the one open source kind of data set is there's a huge amount of user generated contact platforms um, that have been kind of sucked up into these systems. Um, which has all sorts of issues around IP and, um, and artist rights. And so even with this huge amount of data that is being taken off the internet that has been generated by people that is there, it's looking more and more likely in the future that these systems won't be taking this imagery that kind of exists on the internet but it will be using images generated by, by Midjourney or Dali or kind of text generated by ChatGPT as input, um, as training material in the future. So it will train itself off what it has generated um, rather something that is artificially manufactured rather than made by the real world. This is called synthetic data, and it's something that I'm becoming increasingly more interested in. Part of the reason for this is that there's this arms race between these different AI companies, and they're running out of easily accessible and high quality data to train up on. And because of increasing regulation and um, around what they, they can and can't use, and because of all the rightful kind of um, pushback that they've been getting from artists and media organizations over the volume and provenance of so much personal data in this um, technology. And the, these companies, the, the chief executive of OpenAI said that he, will, he is pretty confident that all data will soon be synthetic data, all data will be this generated data, and that generic data from the web is no longer good enough to to increase the performance of these AI models because the web is so noisy and messy that it's not really representative of the data of what people want. And for me, this is really, really interesting. There's always been an anxiety around the artifice of the output of machine learning, but now there's this gonna be this worry of the input. And we're moving from a kind of this way of constructing for, from um, from describing constructing and describing the world from being this um, human to human way of describing it, like encyclopedias, human to machine kind of data sets to machine to machines, which is synthetic data. Um, and there are known issues with kind of like um, using the input internet as input to get outputs. Um, um, without human curation. Uh, Wikipedia is notorious for underrepresenting um, women and minorities, and this bleeds into kind of the, the knowledge that it has of the world, and it's repeated and intensified. This graphic is taken from an investigation done by Bloomberg, where they created 5,000 images using stable diffusion 
to show the racial and gender disparities that are taken um, to extremes worse than those found in the real world. If you, they, if you look at the different, um, and they analyze the skin tone of the images of the people that they, when they typed in, make me a picture of an architect, make me a picture of a lawyer, make me a picture of a fast food worker, and found that all the high paying occupations, primarily um, the images generated were of white people, and the low paying um, occupations, the images generated were people of color. The world is run by white male CEOs and women are rarely doctors, lawyers or judges. Men with dark skin commit crime and women with dark skin flip burgers. Um, and so that is kind of what is being built into these systems which will then be used to train future systems. And this kind of um, weirdness of trying to get a machine to understand what a machine has created is something that I started to explore in a very tiny way um, through a recent piece, a recent experiment that I did this year. This year. Um, I created something called, I uh, created a work, a synthetic iris data set, um, building off uh, the iris data set, which is a, a, a statistical data set that's very often used um, in machine learning. I put the same prompt through DALI and Midjourney and Stable Diffusion uh, to create an iris. And as you can kind of see on this um, screenshot, some of the time it got it pretty well, and other times it would just create absolute nonsense. Um, they're flowers, but they're definitely not irises. Um, I took these 150 flowers that I generated and then ran them through various different computer vision algorithms to see what a machine would see um, and see how a computer vision API would interpret um, the image. The organization of the content is dependent very much on technological and cultural codes and there's this duplicity that kind of occurs through language. Iris has two meanings, at least in English. It means a flower, but it also means the center of an eye. And when I was going through these kind of, um, these images and having them analyze it, you could see that there was definitely something had happened because it kept on seeing eyeballs and eyes in these images where definitely none existed. And it kept on, um, seeing these very, very weird things with incredibly high confidence, like things with the sky or an event, and they would see purple when it was pink, and things like that, where to a human it was very obvious that those things didn't exist and sit into the, in the image, but the machine, reading this machine-generated thing, there was an incredibly high confidence that they did. And a lot of ways this work is an inverse of Myriad, which was me trying to kind of capture the real world and analyze it, and kind of make it into something that a machine could understand. Whereas this work is a machine generating what a machine thinks a flower is, and then a machine analyzing it, and then trying to make me understand what is in it. And the other, I've talked a lot about um, image generation, but there is also text generation that is also kind of sitting alongside this huge wave of, um, of uh, uh, machine learning. And uh, this is, a, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I don't often talk about um, that is an ongoing project that I've been um, looking at around fake news for many, many years. Because in addition to kind of... Um, kind of the way that these, these systems are being kind of uh, presented, they're already making their way into our existing ecosystems. Um, and they're already kind of becoming embedded into the internet. I have a long running project um, that I've been working on in partnership with, the, with Purdue University in America, which is trying to find the physical copy of every single local newspaper that has closed in the past uh, 15 years. So basically from when Facebook um, opened. And this research has led uh, me into a lot of um, 
uh, kind of like understanding of the rise of what of fake news and fake news sites, which are otherwise called pink slime, um, which has accompanied the decline of authentic local news. And this actually has huge ramifications for multiple things around um, people's belief in democracy, people's engagement in civic society, people's sense of um, history in their community with the, with the um, decline of local news sites. Uh, local news sites are closing so rapidly. Uh, um, there's only a fifth left um, from what, when they started, from, when, um, from 2007. But what's replacing them are fake news sites, fake local news sites, which to all intents and purposes look like they are real local news, but they are just being um, generated using AI text generation tools combined with software that kind of auto-generates these sites, creating masses of domains that are filled with huge amounts of text. And then these sites are then filled with programmatic advertising slots, which serve up real ads over fake content driven by advertising algorithms so vast and complex that barely anyone understands them. And so that the world of the internet is getting muddied and shifted and changed by this large amount of fake content that is going on to it. Um, and it's something that I've seen in this research project. And I think it's very noticeable that OpenAI only trains their models on the internet as it was up until ChatGPT was released, as it doesn't want this, um, its models to get contaminated. Which, so there's this kind of tension between kind of wanting to have more synthetic data, but not wanting it to be kind of synthetic data that anyone creates. It has to be the right type of synthetic data. Because it doesn't take much for these systems to be fooled or contaminated. Nightshade is a tool um, that has been created by the University of Chicago um, that performs a data poisoning attack against generative AI models. Um, so it kind of takes um, uh, poison samples which look visually identical to benign um, kind of images with matching text prompts, but the text the way that it's labeled kind of creates this madness. So instead of a hat, it will describe kind of like a mushroom or something. And it can corrupt a model really, really quickly. So if you add, so you can see how in this thing that if you add 100 poison concepts, suddenly the kind of quality and ability for these models to work kind of like crashes dramatically. And it can destabilize these, um, the general features of a text-to-image generative model, effectively disabling its ability to generate meaningful images. And the use of nightshade and similar tools can, be, can start to be seen as a defense for content creators um, against web scrapers that ignore kind of like opt-in, opt-out. You can kind of put these kind of like poisoned images on your website so that it will start to corrupt um, these like large, um, data sets that are being created by these um, huge corporations. But this is not to say that kind of like all synthetic data is bad and that all of this kind of like desire to create um, fake images is problematic. Uh, scientific modeling of physical systems um, have kind of constantly tried to use this fake data um, but this idea of kind of synthetic data as kind of like, as, as it's being kind of discussed now, kind of comes about from the 1990s with the rise of machine learning and computer uh, power coupled with kind of stricter regulations around data management. Um, and what I think is interesting is that data doesn't have to necessarily be rooted in the real world for it to have value. And this idea of fabricating data and slotting it in where it's missing or hard to get hold of can start to kind of create um, a creative pathway or make something kind of quite interesting. Uh, and these are just two examples of some very early synthetic data that has been used um, in machine learning to kind of generate um, generate some um, models. 
well-crafted synthetic data, um, data that preserves, which in a, in a technical term is data which preserves statistical integrity but highlights something um, that cannot be found in the real world, is where I am kind of moving um, my practice towards or thinking through in some recent projects. Um, I used my original TULIP data set, the one that I showed earlier that I made in 2018, to create a new data set of synthetic black tulips. Black tulips are, true black tulips are impossible to find um, in the natural world. Uh, there are uh, some growers kind of created a nearly black one in the 80s, um, but true black tulips are impossible to find. And so I tried to create this data set of black tulips with new labels. Um, and the results that came out were weird and uncanny and transmuted my original tulips into this fantastical biological impossibility. I yet then used this data set to train a, a, a GAN. And you can kind of see that the, the imagery that it produces is weird and uncanny. I use this to make a new work, um, an NFT, uh, which challenges the volatile digital art market by making, I made an NFT using kind of two interlocking smart contracts so that the NFT itself cannot be bought for more than it was purchased for, um, trying to break the usual protocols of major NFT marketplaces um, by forcing it to only be uh, bid on and buy um, on a custom marketplace that I created. So it expands on earlier work that I made with tulips um, and NFTs, called a piece called Blooming Veiling in 2019, and but undermines the speculative potential that I had kind of previously been um, thinking through. It kind of tries to mitigate hyperinflation or, or deflation to create a more tempered economic engagement and restrain the exponential growth of technology and finance. Um, and it echoes um, Dumas's exploration of rarity in the novel of the same name. And because uh, Historically, black tulips have been an almost impossible thing and creating the speculative desire of one. And I found it interesting to try and make something that serves both as a critique of value and a commentary on the evolving nature, nature of speculation in the digital realm. And then the last kind of thing, and then this is just an installation shot of it. And then the last thing that I wanted to end on is another piece that I have made recently, which is currently on um, its final week up in Times Square. It's a midnight moment, um, which is where you get all of the screens in Times Square for three minutes at midnight. Um, because this was a very weird and artificial and synthetic place to be installing a work. Um, and this piece called Circadian Nocturne explores the relationship between time and memory representation through the lens of night blooming flowers um, and only kind of exists for three minutes. Um, and it's partly made of real imagery of plants that I grew in my garden and partly made with these synthetic images that I trained again on. And it builds on existing projects that explore the interplay of, con on, of complex algorithms to explore non-human ways of keeping time. But this piece features these AI-generated animations of night blooming and night-scented flora, chronobiological clocks set against the mechanical and digital structures that set the pace of our contemporary lives. And these artificial sh flowers shifting and morphing, I feel, kind of hint at this deep power that comes at the intersection of the natural and the synthetic, a garden created in this deeply artificial place. And it's this paradox that I find so interesting and that I think is so beautiful and important to explore. Thank you.